So, uh, we begin with a quote from Oscar Wilde, be yourself as everyone else is taken. Um, so, as Anthony said uh, in that gracious introduction, I study symbolic interactionism. Uh, to explain what that is, it's a sociological uh, discipline, sort of emerged in the 50s and 60s, a little bit earlier if you sort of count some of our proto-social theorists. Um, and it looks at the, the way we ascribe meaning to the interactional scripts between us. So we, uh, prior to this time in sociology, we had functionalism, which said that every sort of group in society had its purpose, and then we had conflict theory, which was basically Marxism at that point. Uh, those theories evolved, symbolic interactionism came out and said, what if the human being actually has an active self? What if it's got something that is interacting with this society, and what would that interaction do, and how does that interaction work? Um, and so the, the sort of early theorist George Herbert Mead, Herbert Bloomer, uh, said that the self and our social interaction is all focused on symbols, and how we ascribe meaning uh, in our interpretations of the interactions that we have. Um, a little bit later, a, a Canadian who escaped Canada to the United States, Irving Goffman, came out with the theory of dramaturgy. And I could explain and expound on this theory a lot, but he has a really beautiful metaphor in his book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, and that is uh, of the stage, uh, of a theater production. And he describes human social interaction as being a theater production. Uh, so you are on a stage, there are scripts, there's costumes, there's props, and there's an audience. And each one of these things sort of corresponds to a different way the self, the individual social actor, interacts with the social world and the social reality around them. So for instance, right now, I can just sort of walk you through what it looks like. I am even, like, literally on a stage. I have an audience whom I'm gauging the reaction to, and I modify my scripts to sort of base that. I have a literal script, but I also have a socialized script. I know how I'm supposed to conduct myself in an academic way. Uh, I know I'm being recorded for YouTube, so I'm not going to swear, so we can be monetized. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. And, uh, I can inject humor, and then when it gets laughs, it sort of diffuses the tension and gives me, I mean, a symbolic interactionist can really di dissect every little bit. People who talk to me often really hate it. Um, so that's sort of my theoretical perspective, and what I uh, sort of decided a few months ago, I will say to you, this isn't like my dissertation work or anything, this is what a friend of mine calls a side hustle. Um, I just got angry one night, wrote an essay, and then this sort of blossomed out of that. Um, the problem with this dramaturgical perspective is that the stage doesn't really exist as it did in 1956 when Goffman published his book. Things have changed quite a bit since then. Social interaction happens on a lot of different stages. The stage I'm looking at is the social media stage, the digital self, the digital uh, world that we inhabit, which I'm really glad you went first because like, there's so much more philosophy in yours, this is just complaining. Um, uh, so, the difficulty of applying dramaturgy to this is that the social self that we pr present on social media is not happening actively. It's not happening in the moment as we perform it. Um, we say social media is, is sort of, you know, up to the minute and, and live, if you will. But this is a live social interaction. I'm seeing what the interactions are between me, uh, my internal self, the social self I'm presenting, and my audience, and sort of fixing how I interact and presenting myself in a certain way depending on how each minute goes by. In the digital world, we don't really see this happening. And for a while, there wasn't a lot of application in symbolic interactionism to this idea of the social media self, because social media is a relatively new social phenomenon, even though, um, as we'll look at at the end of this, it's sort of existed as long as the internet. Um, so there's a theorist author uh, named Bernie Hogan, and in 2010 he wrote a, a piece that proposed, very short, I think it's like nine pages, and it says, and half of them are references. Um, what if instead of presenting the self, and instead of performing on a stage, we're curating an exhibit like an art museum. So rather than choosing, uh, reacting to an audience actively, we're picking specific components to share in our social landscape. And I thought, well, that's basically what I'm arguing. So that's the sort of theoretical direction I'm going to be walking you through uh, this evening. 
So basically what we need to know, as a, I, I'm a fan of operationally defining even though I'm not a researcher, um, digital interaction is a different form of social interaction than what we're doing. Uh, the sort of distinction I'm going to say, which is not in any way implying moral superiority, but I will call this sort of organic social interaction uh, authentic social interaction. And that is sort of based on the, the Goffman theory that I have an audience that I'm constantly reacting to and my socialization, my values, my internal sort of monologue, my interaction between the I and the me, which is a whole other conversation, um, that is influencing how I'm presenting myself to you. Whereas the online self is something where I have a platform, a window through which people can look at my life and I can choose specifically what is in that window. I can't choose everything that's in the window right now. Um, that is sort of how this works, you know, it's, it's a constant active process. Um, when we also talk about this presentation of self, we have to keep in mind what Goffman called face work. Uh, and this is the idea of the actual construction of face. So we have the, the saying saving face, and in the Goffman sense, face is like how well you're being received. So if I'm not being well received or if I'm experiencing a different reaction, I have to do what's called face work uh, to sort of save face in these negative interactions to sort of release myself from stigma. Um, we have backstage and front stage work and, and basically I'm, what, I'm, what you're seeing is the front stage, but there's a whole lot of social processes that are going on behind the scenes that you can't see and you don't know what those scripts are. You can only interpret what you're seeing. And as a result, I can only interpret what I'm observing from you. So the exhibition of self. I don't worry, I'm talking about. See, I get ahead of myself sometimes. Um, the, the difference, though, with the exhibition of self is we do, I, I don't say there's not an audience, because there is an audience. And we are reacting to what that audience wants to see. And the medium that we sort of react to that audience is not this active process of social inter, uh, interaction, but it is social validation. Uh, that's the driving force that's sort of at the, the core of what we present and what we curate and sort of exhibit in ourselves. Basically, we see what works, what gives us this validation. We see that from our interaction with other people's social media selves, and we emulate what works in order to get the same validation. Uh, so for the purposes of this validation, I've sort of defined it as a temporary and fleeting feeling of positive recognition. Uh, it feels good, so we want more. It's easy to get in the digital world. Uh, likes equal validation, and therefore I must pursue likes. Um, this sort of concept of validation comes from a book uh, by Alan Downs, which is uh, actually a really wonderful sort of queer theory, queer psychology book, but he talks about the difference between validation and fulfillment, uh, where validation is something that happens fleetingly, and it sort of picks us up just a little bit here and there, and, and, and fulfillment is something that's a little more long term. So that's the conflict we're looking at with the idea of the social media self, is the idea of validation versus fulfillment. And I propose that validation is far, far, far more easier, or far, far, far easier uh, to obtain through this process of curation, what we, what we show. Now we're going to get a little conflict theorist, because I am a sociologist, and it's sort of required that we be a little Marxist. Um, the question, what earns us validation? And that is, in our current stage, so think of Instagram, if you, well, if everybody uses Instagram, you know, think about what pictures, what content gets the most likes. And I propose it's sort of a, it's bourgeois symbols of social, economic, and cultural capital. Um, we get likes for posting what gives us the best chance to make us seem like we are members of the elite class. So it's a, an evolution of, of Bourdieu's idea of, of cultural capital, of, of social capital, these things that mark us as elite members of society in sort of an authentic social you know, interaction. I always use the example with my students, if you come to my house and I have an original Da Vinci or an original Matisse painting, I, I like Andy Warhol, but nobody, that doesn't have <laughs> as much cultural capital as the classics. Um, if I have that on my wall, it's assumed that I have a certain degree of status. I have a certain degree of economic status because I can afford such a thing, and that I'm in some way cultured. We do the same thing in social media. You know, if I post a picture of me writing this speech on a typewriter, which I did just for the irony of it, <laughs> um, 
that gives me cultural capital because it shows that I'm an academic, I'm doing something professional, I'm speaking, people are listening to me, I'm probably getting paid to the people who don't know what grad school is. <laughs> um, and I'm doing it in an analog and cool sort of hipster way. So it gives me status and it gives me likes. And then, in, you know, as, as Michael talked about, we have this physiological change where now all of a sudden we're getting a hit of dopamine and serotonin and all these wonderful chemicals that we're all ridiculously addicted to based on people's acceptance of what I've shown online. And that feels great. It makes it feel like we're in a crowd of people who are telling us we're valid and everything we're doing is fantastic. What I'm arguing, though, is that that's validation. It's not fulfillment. I am not going to care about the, at this stage, four likes on that picture. Um, for, I, I don't care about it now. I didn't care about it when it was happening. It doesn't permeate into our sort of everyday social life. But it is so critical to shaping what we curate for people to see. I mean, this is not really different from how we interact in, in sort of the real world. It's just much, much, much more instantaneous. Uh, and we have this opportunity to perfectly pick and choose what we see. And that gives us this way to sort of interpret what is elite and then just show exactly what is elite. Whereas there's always hang-ups in an in a authentic interaction. Um, an example of these hang-ups is I am a, from a working class background. I'm the fir first generation graduate student, um, and my working class roots show through in my academic self, and my habitus is not quite fit into the field of academia, and my academic self bleeds into my working class self, so when I go home for the holiday break, it's going to be weird, because, <laughs> you know, I can't talk about social theory with all the people I normally would interact with back then. It's also America, so I can't talk about social theory anywhere, that's why I'm here. So, uh, yeah, so we, we are seeking this validation, I think, for two reasons. One, because we see it as sort of advancing our status, although I don't think we actually believe that. I think that's sort of a, a subconscious, culturally constructed thing that it's going to advance our status. We don't necessarily believe we're going to become uh, elite by doing what we do. But second, it gives us this instant hit of validation. It's, it's, super addictive and it's a it's a quick high that dissipates and we need more of it. I have here written in hand, by hand, we should rethink Descartes' I think therefore I am and say I post therefore I am. <laughs> but part of what happens then, so we, we now have the intentionality of why we do this. We, we're seeking validation. But what does that actually do in terms of our experience with our own social reality? It causes us to augment both our conceptualization of our social interactions and our social reality and our immediate social selves, but it also causes us to augment the behaviors we do and the things we take part in and the places we go. It starts to sort of graft over into real life about how we have to construct this uh, perfect social media self in order to continually get this validation. So. It can change how you actually interact with it. I was on a walk with somebody in Beacon Hill Park when we first moved here, and I was looking at rocks and feathers, and this person was Snapchatting that we were in Beacon Hill Park. And so I have to argue at what point is the, the presumed capital of that interaction on Snapchat the same as sort of this little mundane moment of exploring nature. And that's a whole other sort of discussion on object-oriented ontologies that I am not prepared to do. So, in effect, we're, we're now sort of searching for opportunity for validation. And what does that do to the concept of the self? This, this idea that's constructed through early childhood socialization, that's built uh, and constructed through our interaction with our social reality, that also constructs our social reality. It starts to devalue the nature of the self in how we present and perform it in our authentic experience. And that is because we are sort of met with an instantaneous comparison between what we have in real life and what Orji would call the cultural arbitrary, or that which the elite class has. We are immediately feeling sort of undervalued in our pr 
pursuit for this because we can't get as much validation as those things that represent the elite class do. So it's a, it's a dangerous place to sort of start looking at what it does to our actual experience of self. Yeah, I say we're, we're becoming, a, uh, not a society, but we're becoming a species that is solely focused on this accumulation of fleeting social validation. And for me, I think that's horrifying. But that's, that's sort of a result of what this new thing social media is doing for us. It's forcing us to be focused on this devaluation of our own selves and, uh, in my view, this sort of shameless accumulation of social validation. So we have this reliance then, this reliance on things that look good on social media. So where do we go from there? Like, well, what constitutes an authentic social interaction? This is sort of getting at this idea of authenticity versus uh, it's almost too, too uh, obscene. Um, too false. Uh, this idea of, of a false identity versus our authentic presentation of self. So I kind of propose three criteria for what constitutes this authentic presentation of self and this authentic experience of social reality. Uh, and I sort of over, uh, over, overall uh, refer to it as authenticity. Uh, one, it has a noticeable and long-lasting affective benefit. So long-lasting meaning more than a few minutes. Uh, as you, know, you post a post on Instagram, you get 43 likes in the first hour, and then it just tails off and everybody's moved on. Uh, that's a fleeting nature of this validation. Authenticity has sort of a more longitudinal effect. You are experiencing something that you sort of gain a positive affective benefit from into the future, at least a little while. It provides a sense of fulfillment in one's internal identity. So identity being this culmination of scripts and costumes and props and ideas and values and mores and norms and culture and all of the stuff that makes us us, we feel in our sort of authentic experience with these social realities that there's some form of fulfillment in alignment with that internal being. So. I don't really know how to define it, frankly. It's, it's, you know, watching a sunset over the beach is kind of a, a classic example of this, where you see something that just transcends your petty social squabbles and just resonates with that inner voice you have. That's a, a criterion for this authentic experience. It can also be something as simple as watching Netflix with your partner and just taking a break and saying, wow, Life is pretty good right now. It, it puts us in this state where we sort of recognize who we are and where we are in a good way. This is also the most positive presentation I've ever given. <laughs> I'm usually quite pessimistic. Um, and I will say this can be experienced without a, a direct social interaction, either digital or organic, with another person. You can have these authentic social interactions um, on your own. Because in symbolic interactionism, we sort of hold that the self is always interacting with itself, so you're always doing something social. So those are the three bits of, of what this idea of authenticity is. When we look at the presentation of self in everyday digital life, and, and sort of the focus on exhibition rather than presentation and performance, um, we have to sort of get to this point of a... Uh, understanding this disingenuous concept, I think, of what looks good versus what feels good. And right now, we're sort of conflating the two. We're saying that what looks good online makes us feel good because of the social validation we have instantly from strangers across the world. And we don't really know how to navigate that authentic experience anymore because of our over-reliance on this sort of emerging social thing. And I, we might be a little removed from it because we have the privilege of being able to think about these things and have philosophical discussions. And we are also, I'm guessing, all over the age of 14, where this is something that's emerged in our lifetimes, where it's not something that's ingrained within our social strata from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I really worry uh, for, for that generation in that sense. Mm -hmm.
So my second to last point here is this idea of a coalescence of social inadequacy and what I say in my poetic 3 a.m. voice, the ensuing melancholia. So we now are at a place where, if it's from Freud, he wrote a little bit and it just sticks in there. Um, so we're at a point where we modify our presentation of life and our, our behavior and our interactional scripts to get us validation and get us this social media capital. What does it actually make us feel like? And I would argue that it sort of gives us an inability to feel fulfilled in everyday life because it glamorizes the awesome in the old old term way of the term, not the 80s term of the word awesome, but something that tr creates you know, a true sense of awe and wonder has now been sort of marked as what we need to do in order to feel normal. And we're constantly being exposed to this sort of social reality because the people we follow are the people who are also given this. It's bombarding us with social interaction and we feel we have to fit in with this too. So that creates the environment of awe and it creates the expectation of awe. Now what do we do if there isn't this sort of culturally defined uh, amount of awe in our everyday life? You know, I didn't do anything today that would get me a sponsor on Instagram. And I'm guessing, I don't know about the rest of you to be quite honest, but I, I don't know if that happened. Whereas you have people who are sort of making millions for sponsorships and have made a career out of this who do amazing things every day for the photographic value of it. And you're creating a generation of people who expect that to be the normal performance of life. And I think that's a really dangerous thing because what we're doing is we're creating an expectation of constant wonder and constant excitement uh, with a reality that is far different from that. And we've devalued the mundane to a point where we can't um, be happy in the mundane. We always have to see the, the excitement going on. So the example I sort of use to describe this, as I've already mentioned, is this idea of Instagram travel accounts or, or travel influencers. Um, people who are in a different country every other day, who, who take beautiful photos on the top of the Alps in Switzerland, and then they're in Belgium, and then they, they never go to Eastern Europe, which hurts my soul just a little bit, but they, they go to these sort of, you know, central tourist locations, and they get, uh, they're doing two, th they're doing several things. One, they're gaining this validation from their followers, they're reproducing this idea of regularity, of the, that is what life can be in their followers, and they're also making a, a boatload of money doing it. So it's a consumerism thing, and it's also this sort of psychosocial interaction where it's an illusion of normalcy, this level of affluence. And when that is all you flood your social media feed with, you start to expect to be living that way. And when you don't live that way, you're not fulfilled in the actions you're doing. And I think we have a, a new thing in our generation called FOMO, or the fear of missing out, mm -hmm. uh, which is described as a anxiety of what you might not get to do, mm -hmm. which I think before our generation was called existential dread. But <laughs> now it's, it's like a, a defined thing, and there's rumors that it'll be in the DSM. This idea that where I am right now, I might not ever get to see Machu Picchu, or I might not get to do this, and that creates real anxiety in the moment, and I think that's directly uh, a, a physiological response to this reality of what we're experiencing. And so for those people, those people who are feeling this anxiety of this, I propose sort of like three different ways they can interact with that anxiety. Um, the first is they might just experience a deep existential depression about their place in life. They just may not feel fulfilled in what they're doing uh, because the standard for what is socially acceptable is so high. Uh, second, they might prioritize what they find to be in demand for this social validation. They may conflate social validation and social media with what they need to do in real life to fix what they perceive to be wrong with them. Uh, so you might see somebody all of a sudden decide, well, I need to go travel the world in order to fix my life. Um, and then the, sort of the consequences of that building afterwards. And then third, which leads into sort of the fun topic of the evening, is people who just sort of throw all of that to the wind and say, I'm going to fabri fabricate 
a deeply inauthentic and completely false mm -hmm. social media identity. Which leads me into the last section, which I've titled, Inauthentic False Selves, colon, the Catfish. This is a storytelling component. Mm -hmm. I was not personally catfished in the relationship sense, but um, this is actually fairly recent. This one inspired this part. This is not part of the article. Um, recently, I, I was a, a member of an online community because as, as angry as I get about this stuff, I'm still connected to all of it, uh, which is the true nature of sociology. Um, <laughs> Basically what we had is uh, in this community, this uh, about 85 people, uh, one user was incredibly popular among everyone else. She was 25 years old, she had just completed medical school and was a physician at a prominent hospital in New York City. She had three children who uh, she adopted after her best friend and her husband died in an automobile accident. Uh, her and her husband of, partner of I think four years, husband of two, uh, adopted these children. Over the course of, of knowing her, her youngest child was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, in and out of the hospital, uh, negative reaction to chemotherapy meds, blood clots in the lungs, all of that. Not really. What we noticed is this person went on a uh, vacation to Paris, which, cool, good for you. You're a fancy New York doctor, you probably have a wonderful salary that none of us have. Um, and so she posted pictures of her trip to Paris. And then all of a sudden you start to see that they're stock photos. They're, they're below the first you know, eight bars of Google image results, but they're there. Um, she posts pictures of her husband that she's actually stolen from the Instagram story of, uh, frankly, weirdly enough, of gay couples who are on vacation in Paris. <laughs> she had a fetish for that too, but that's a different discussion. Um, so she's, she's done this and we, you know, myself and several of the other adults, came to the conclusion that this person really wasn't who they were saying they were, and we need to use our 1980s hacker skills and find out who she actually is. So what we found out is it's, uh, it's an individual who's, I'm not going to disclose any personal information because I think that's illegal. Um, it's not social theory without a little bit of illegality. <laughs> We're radicals here. Uh, anyway, she just graduated high school last year and she began her first year of university in the fall. Uh, she was 19 years old and from the Midwest of the United States. Um, based on other evidence, she had a sort of severe case of social anxiety, of inadequacy, of feeling like she's not enough uh, for the group around her. Now, this is why I say I really feel bad for the, the generation younger than me is that I can have these sort of, you know, I'm different, but I, a individual sort of in my position can have uh, these interactions with people that are sort of genuine and based on the idea of what we in the social sciences call intersectionality, where we can acknowledge all of these identities people have and accept people for who they are. Uh, this individual was not in a, a social reality where that was the case. So what she found is that by authoring long posts about all of the horrible things in her life, she would start to get sympathy. Mm -hmm. She would have random people start commenting, telling her how amazing she was for adopting these kids. I'm sorry you have to deal with this. Her Reddit upvotes were, I think she has like 400,000 karma on Reddit as a result of these things. Of complete lies, of absolute fabrications. So, why? Why does this happen? I argue that it's sort of an escape of the lack of social validation and the escape of, or not the escape, but like the jumping full force into the arms of the addiction we have to social validation, where it's never enough, so I have to keep going. It's never fulfilling. It never provides me that long-term sense of resonance with my internal being. So I can create this idealized version of the self and people will interact with it into a, such a point that it's going to provide me with what I perceive I need. And she wasn't cosplaying as a 33-year-old mailroom clerk from Milwaukee. She was cosplaying as a, a director of medical students at a prominent New York hospital who worked in the UK and New York and went on all these fancy vacations. She was pretending to be a member of the bourgeois class when she isn't. She's petty bourgeois, I think, is what we are as students. 
So that's an extreme example, but finally I'll say, you know, it's not really that different from what our actual social media stuff is. Like hers was all based on lies, but it wasn't for a very long time to the audience. We have no way of knowing who or what we're interacting with. And it's real as long as sort of the, uh, the curtain is around the little man projecting the Wizard of Oz in front of us. So I, I have a piece of advice to offer, which is my inspirational speech moment. Um, I would say just focus on the, the usual motions of life, uh, to find fulfillment in the smallest and dullest moments and to be a self-validating individual. Find the ability to resonate with what you're experiencing. I had a couple of other points that came up in writing this. I had a, a whole other essay, but like I read it out loud and it really sounded like the Unabomber's Manifesto, and so I, <laughs> I buried that one for, that's like a posthumous publication. Um, but I, I sort of looked at the idea of how sex, sexuality, intimacy, and dating are co-opted by this idea of the, the digitalization of self, this curation of identity, um, Tinder, Bumble, Grindr, the thousands that exist, it, it's, it very much boils down to the same thing, presenting the best self you have, uh, and that led to the whole sort of reemergence of a new kind of hookup culture that's different from the one in the 60s, there's worse music now, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, it's changed our interactions with how we consume products and how we participate in capitalism. Um, we now have things like Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes. In Canada, we had something called Munchies, where I was before, which was not about drugs. And we now don't interact with the service industry. We interact with an intermediary through our phones who removes us from that sort of mundane social process. And I, I question what that does in terms of late-stage capitalism, in terms of the self-identity. And then finally, a sort of point that I was going to bring up at some point was it changes our way we outwardly express, express emotions to those we know. And so I think of like seeing people on Facebook talking about, oh, my sister has cancer, uh, my father passed away, uh, whatever. We now no longer have to feel empathy because we can do the little heart emoji and say, you know, sending good thoughts. Mm -hmm. So we're removed from our responsibility of empathetic connection mm -hmm. as a result of this too. Final closing, I am going to read a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of this book by Stanley Milgram. So if you don't know Stanley Milgram, he is a social psychologist in the 50s, 60s, 70s. He did the wildly unethical but still fun study of obedience to authority, that guy. Um, he did other stuff too, and it's, it's funny to me, a student last term came to me and said, well, my professor said to just completely ignore Milgram because he doesn't do anything. Like, there's no obedience to authority in this whole book. Um, this is the last essay in here, and it was written sort of as towards the end of Milgram's life in 1984, and it's called Network Love. And it was right when CompuServe came out with the first instant messaging chat rooms in the 80s that were sort of publicly available, although he did his through his university because it wasn't publicly publicly available because it was expensive. And he, it's only two pages long, and he talks about his experience of entering this chat room and sort of his thoughts on what this form of interaction is, because Milgram studied human interaction and our, sort of the way we work in the world. So I'm just gonna read a couple of sentences here and there, without context, because it's funnier. But our conversation is interrupted by irrelevant messages from other people. The urgent query, in all caps, any girls on the line, keeps reappearing most often on the screen, just as ambient chatter at a singles bar intrudes into a conversation. The sage, this is the guy he's talking to about internet stuff. The sage proposes we go into a private channel and continue our teletyped conversation uninterrupted. Later on, in one exchange, Red Baron says to Pepper, I am male and I am 20. How about you? Pepper responds, male, 15. Red Baron is not thrilled with this revelation. <laughs> By Pepper is his only response. <laughs> Networkers will throw in words to give emotional coloration to their communication. My handle is Bronx. One user asked, hey Bronx, where are you from? In parentheses, snicker. His final barbed utterance signified the facetious undercurrent of the question, which would be conveyed by the, other, by the tone of his voice in a face-to-face -face conversation. 
By using this kind of device, networkers humanize the emotionally impoverished nature of the medium. Um, later on, he talks about how singles can get married through singles bar chat rooms. And finally, his little sort of predictive sentence at the end. By the 21st century, this is something all networkers, whether in search of love or merely companionship, will have to wonder about from time to time. And so it's been a thing that's been sort of permeating culture as, as time has progressed. And we're at a, in my, in my view, we're sort of past the point of no return that it's become so deeply ingrained in future generations that it's going to change how, what our social landscape is. Um, but I'm still sort of hopeful that we can maybe liberate ourselves just a little bit. So with that, uh, questions then. I always have questions. Go for so it. If anyone has questions before, I can wait. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. I like I like that we I think we've sort of come to similar conclusions that it's digital media sort of it, it, it can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. It's kind of where I also kind of end up. Yeah. It's kind of inherent, but. Uh, one thing I was thinking about was, um, because this could be because of the way that I approach the self, um, for me the self has no actual substance. Mm -hmm. And so because it's never had any real substance, any time we can give it substance, we automatically go towards it. And so digital media appears to give substance, like you're saying, is yeah. it, it's sort of inauthentic. Um, but I was just wondering if you think without digital media, can the self have substance? I think you kind of touch on it, but I was wondering if you wanted to um, maybe speculate about yeah. non-digital selfness, of bere like bereft of this, because obviously for our lifetimes it's been more or less there for yeah. the majority of it. I think the idea of sort of physicalization of self is really interesting, and I, I get back, I have a very limited philosophy background, but I get back to this idea of do thoughts have physical existence or not? And I have always been under the, you know, the idea that if I write my thoughts in a journal or in a book, they become physical. As for the self, I would argue that I think the self does have substance. I don't think it has quantitative substance in the term, in the way physicists would describe. Um, but it is something that I, I actually disagreed a little bit with your point in your presentation, that it is something that's continually new. Uh, because I believe through our social interaction and sort of the, the socialization and construction of self, that it is something that has both a historical sort of time frame and a future time frame. In fact, weirdly enough, the Milgrams here, in another case of another unethical psychologist, uh, Philip Zimbardo has a theory of the temporal self and understanding where within our conceptualization of time do we exist within the self. He argues it's different depending on your early socialization. But I would argue that the self does have substance, and that substance is the interaction that you present. Uh, Mead, in his book, Mind, Self, and Society, says that the problem with behaviorism, the problem with sort of empirical psychology, is that we consider the behavior, the observable, to be the only indication of the self. And behavior is fleeting. But he argues that the behavior is actually an end point of a very long process of social interaction within yourself and between the self and the social. And so I would argue that it, it does have substance. It's just maybe not substance in terms of something that's immediately accessible and immediately retrievable, if that makes sense. Yeah, I like that. Yes? Um, thank you for the presentation. I really liked it. Um, so we were talking a lot about Instagram, and uh, I was wondering if you had any opinion about it. So the way I see social validation on social media, uh, validation on social media is about not only about the likes that my picture is getting, but okay. it should be the likes should be more than my friends. Yes. The 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 likes that my friends' picture is getting. So that is also like it's also a competition. So mm -hmm. I was wondering. What do you think about this? Because Instagram has recently started pulling down likes. So there are no more likes. Right. So only I can see how many likes my picture gets, but yep. I can't see how many picture, uh, how many likes my friend's picture gets. Right. So I was wondering, how do you understand validation then, mm -hmm. if Instagram is getting rid of likes? I think that's a really good question. I think the, the competitiveness of it is definitely real. Mm -hmm. and I have a case in point. I, I did some experimenting on social media so I could have things to talk about today, and I went on to, I, I don't use Reddit, but I made an account, and I went to the r slash sociology, and I said, 
Are there any other sociologists who are symbolic interactionists out there? Which I thought was a innocent question. It got, I think, 16 upvotes. The first comment was a long article about how you should apply Bourdieu and Goffman and, and being in one camp is deleterious to the entire, like it just completely philosophically destroying me for claiming to be one part of one intellectual community. And that person was given a gold medal by somebody else, which is a, a sort of form of currency. So right, right, I was already... Yeah. It costs actual money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was really upset at this person. I was like, I was questioning myself and my value as a scholar. I was, uh, yeah, this was last night. I was really angry. And then I'm like, why? Why am I upset that my one question that really doesn't matter? It, it benefited this person so much. Why not me? Because I asked it. <laughs> With Instagram getting rid of likes, I think what it'll do is it'll create a certain degree of mystery about the competition because it's always going to be a part of us, mm -hmm. but we're not going to know, and I think that's going to create a sort of building anxiety mm -hmm. of wondering where it is. Maybe if we start seeing our own pictures in the recommended tab, it'll uh, that's the new competition. Mm -hmm. Get them up there. Yeah. So. I think I agree with pretty much everything you say as far as Instagram goes, yeah. but I'm curious about how well this applies to other forms of social media. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because everything I've ever read about insiders within the world of social media, like yeah. people who run this, this, the shows and the moderators and all those things, the vast majority of interactions and what tends to boil mm -hmm. to the surface in Twitter and Reddit and everything yeah. is shit. Right. You know, we have these bots that were originally released to say, like, well, they'll learn mm -hmm. human interaction through Twitter, and right. they ended up being horribly racist and anti-Semitic, and all these kinds of things. Yeah. And so, your much of your argument relies on this idea that we are striving for the elite, mm -hmm. um, and we're seeking validation through that. Yeah. But I wonder if that's a, maybe even a small percentage yeah. of social media interactions, whereas the vast majority is simply whoever is the loudest, most offensive, mm -hmm. and most divisive oh. wins. Here's the thing, though, that's really cool with Bourdieu. The elite is an arbitrary construction. So the elite, in terms of Reddit, you know, if you go to the r slash whatever alt-right part of Reddit, the cultural arbitrary and what de denigrates an elite class there is different than what denigrates an elite class elsewhere. So the elite in that sense are the people who are spouting off transphobia or homophobia or racism. They become the capitalists in that metaphor. Um, so when I say elite, I should have clarified this earlier, I don't necessarily mean in the classic Marxist sense of, of the wealthy, the, the factory owners. I mean. I also sometimes forget I'm not talking to sociologists, so I do apologize. <laughs> Interdisciplinary work is not my strong suit. As that guy on Reddit showed. Um, <laughs> but my, my understanding of the elite is those that possess and control what we consider to be the cultural arbitrary. And cultural arbitrary is basically a fancy way of saying what gives one the perception of having taste. These people who are elite decide what social capital, what cultural capital, you know, what the, the criteria to establish what is elite and what isn't. So within every social social context, there's a different consideration of what elitism is. You know, in, in academia right now, it's it's quantitative science, but maybe not in Canada, in the U.S., like if you're an engineer or a computer scientist or a physicist, you're top dollar, and then people are like, what is sociology? So it, the, the idea of what is elite translates across different, and I think that's sort of how we can conceptualize it. And then across media, um, it doesn't have to be a purely visual thing like Instagram. I think on Twitter, in some circles, you get the most likes and retweets and things if you are uh, pr proving to be a member of the woke uh, group. You know, if you, if you retweet the right things, if you say the right tweets about the right certain social issues using the right buzzwords, you will get validation that way, because you're showing that you're part of the, the Twitter elite, but it's only within a certain group. And you're right, the, the groups that is louder wins. So I think Anthony's. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Forgive me, I have a two part question, and the first question is two parts also. <laughs> <laughs> so, at any rate, I, I wanted to ask is any of the problem in this, um, in this, uh, in the situation that you're trying to diagnose, um, 
to do with the, the model of the self to begin with. And I think of the way in which you constructed validation alongside kind of having an authentic interaction and how the latter requires a kind of immediate social relation. Yeah. Um, and when I mean the model of the self, uh, I kind of thinking of like, you know, Foucault's ideas of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. which, you know, the self, we are increasingly responsible qua self, qua individual to take responsibility for more and more aspects of right. our social life. So you could read validation in that way as me having to take ownership of my of the presumptive responses of other people to my actions and try to have to kind of like anticipate and intuit that every time I put that out. So is the is does that kind of spell out any problem for using the model of the self as starting point in theory? Uh, is the first part of that question. Second part of that question is, does that negatively reflect on what I think some queer theorists might call kind of perverse desire to out the inauthenticity of the mm -hmm. falsely presenting self? Right. And then the final question, which is kind of disjointed from that, is what does your theoretical framework say to the, to the utility monster in this situation, the mm -hmm. person who derives more possible satisfaction out of having a wholly integrated uh, influencer social media self mm -hmm. that we should think completely hollows out their notion of or their experience of individuality and subjectivity but yeah. actually they seem completely psychically well integrated yeah. and well functioning in society. What, how do you say that? Well, I, I will preface it by saying this is not my, not my theoretical perspective. For that you'll have to buy the book available at fine bookstores everywhere next year. <laughs> Only half joking. Um, <laughs> with that, yes, there are limitations uh, in, in framing the self, as, as Goffman and Bloomer and Cooley and Mead have. There, there's limitations in, real, in literally every ontological means by which we apply meaning uh, to what we're doing. Within the context of symbolic interactionism, I, I would agree that it, it presents uh, this dichotomy and this sort of conflict between the authentic and the inauthentic. And then it puts me in a position as theorist of sort of being the moral judge of what is and what isn't authentic, which is dangerous. And it's not a position I presume to take, and it's not one that I have uh, any right to hold. But that's unfortunately sort of sometimes the nature of the game is not to necessarily say what I'm saying is law and therefore I'm the deciding factor, but rather, here's a bunch of ideas. Now let's go test them. Let's go see what's there. Um, I think the, the discussion of, of queer theory is it's a good, it's an interesting direction to go. I had I had thought about bringing up another topic of sort of authenticity of self uh, and, and presentation of self in terms of uh, you know, queer representation online particularly gay representation, it was in an article I wrote. And um, the, I think the, the sort of pitfalls of that can still exist there because the, the sort of cultural arbitrary of what is an authentic uh, gay male self is really dominated by a, a certain online cultural arbitrary. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily as narrow as stereotypes, but it goes into sort of this idea of like, liberal, elite, coastal idea of what a, what a homosexual life is supposed to be, and then that gets repro reproduced as to what uh, we have to be represented as online. So I will I always, with any of my theory stuff, you know, it's, it's not me saying it's right or wrong, it's just being a gadfly on society. <laughs> yeah. uh, this isn't about social media specifically, but it is about digital experience. Um, could you speculate an area where you could have an authentic digital experience mm -hmm. um, that is like an experience that you could not reproduce somewhere outside of the digital? And I'm thinking yeah. in particular like about up games. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. like if those became social in a way that was like, didn't have mm -hmm. that economy that you're yeah. talking about within it. Like, yeah. what might that be? Well, I think it's totally, totally possible to have a valid and authentic and, and meaningfully rich digital experience. I don't let the typewriter fool you. Like, I'm totally for progressing to the future, although I do like the music of the 70s better. Um, but you can still download that. <laughs> I have it on vinyl. I'm outing myself as a hipster more and more this evening. Um, 
But I think, you know, I, I recently watched a thing on Netflix that was called a, a visual album uh, by a, an experimental Japanese indie band, and it was, it was literally like 45 minutes, you know, an album, a long play album, with a, a digital storyline on it. And to me, I think that that was, well, I think, a valid social experience that was fulfilled. There's actually a section of it that I want to show in a class on specifically like neoliberalism and liberation, because you should go watch I don't remember what it's called, but it's <laughs> just find it, just Google it, you'll see. But I, I do think our interaction with things like digital media, digital art, etc., mm -hmm. can be authentic. And, you know, I've had a good amount of digital validation from watching things like John Lennon playing at Madison Square Garden. I was not alive to see that, unfortunately, but I can experience it still, and it's still valid. Uh, and that's also within sort of your, your internal definition of what is your own validity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not against computers. Yeah? Um, I wonder about the, how you would engage with this idea of the rejection of validation in certain concepts, particularly having to do with Instagram. Mm -hmm. So context through which I would frame this would be particularly individuals who would be seen as like Instagram influencers who will go out of their way to achieve what you've described and which I would completely agree with this idea of the leak, particularly young women of projecting this idea of like especially thin, beautiful, well off in, in tropical locations, young women um, putting together these ideas and then of themselves that are presented through an image and then later We've seen in certain instances that have seemingly caught a lot of social media attention, um, posts come out by these individuals saying, like, you have no idea how much misery was put into the creation of that photo. Like, I know that it looks great, and I understand that you all uh, ascribe to this idea of this perfect image that I put forward, but you need to understand that nothing about this is real and everything about this is fake, and that we need to understand that the perceptions of ourselves and our Instagram selves are not the real perceptions of self. And so, in a very perverse roundabout way, I sort of almost see it as like porn in an odd way. It's one. I was just gonna say it's just like porn. Right. So. Yeah. Where where there are those who will see porn as the perception and the way that sex should mm -hmm. be. Although I would hope that everyone in this room would be on the same understanding of like that is not yep. a sexual relationship in a healthy, normal sexual mm -hmm. engagement with a partner. And so that, to me, almost seems like the development and engagement and progression of these sort of conversations about mm -hmm. validation of self with yeah. the individual and then the rejection of that validation in certain contexts. Right, and I wonder to an extent what um, the reaction is from being told that that's not real. Because uh, I think people have been telling kids that porn isn't real for decades. Mm -hmm. and porn stars, performers, mm -hmm. say it's not real. It's still a, a sort of mindset that's there because it's so readily accessible and part of our everyday socialization and social construction of self and social construction of the reality we see. So, you know, if somebody's telling you, oh, it's actually not real, there's a lot of production, there's a bunch of, you know, people there who are a camera crew, etc., it doesn't really hurt the perception. And I think a, a good example of that is something like a Fire Festival, where it had a, it, does everyone, is everyone familiar? Fire Festival was a there's a documentary on Netflix, uh, basically a huge music festival that was advertised heavily through social media. Uh, it was this elite, exclusive experience on a private island in the Caribbean. You go, you know, tickets were ludicrously expensive. All of these acts were supposed to be there, and then people arrived and found that it didn't exist. Uh, it had been a, a whole sort of scam, basically. Um, that, I think, is the same thing. But then if you watch the documentary, you still have people who are talking about it as if it's real. While they're there, they're sort of met with the physical reality of this idea being 100% false and are still clinging to the, uh, the notion that it's reality. So I think we're really hard as a species to tear away from what we consider to be actual reality. And trust me, this is difficult. I live with a physicist and these conversations, <laughs> we have different perspectives on what reality is and it's a hard conversation to have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Emil. Um, there's something, your third, your final, your three solutions, quote unquote, yeah. which are kind of double edged. Oh, yeah. Um, the third one seems to be edging on parody. Mm -hmm. And parody can be a good way to destroy what Guy Debord calls a society spectacle, right? um, where everything becomes a representation. Yeah. It's kind of a lot of what you're describing. But parody, in a sense, 
kind of takes down. And so, in a sense, some of these accounts can become mm -hmm. extremely parodic. Mm -hmm. um, some of our online behavior can become very, by pushing that logic yeah. to its to its extreme, in yeah. a sense, and 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 innocent, in, and they can create a kind of quote unquote authentic experience. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how that fits in. I like this idea of the theater too, because I mean it reminds me of the sans the, the you know sort of the Sanskrit you know the idea that that you are the audience looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. Cooley called it the looking glass self, which I think yeah. is quite poetic. The rest of what he wrote, you really shouldn't read because it's kind of outdated now. But um, that one was really good. It's about how we see it, ourselves and our audience. As far as parody, I think uh, the the solutions you're referring to are those the um, find you know be a, a self-validating individual. Is that what you were critiquing? Yeah. But there's also an example, for instance, in pornography. I think there's a famous example of um, a, a pornographic actor acting with a total straight face, mm -hmm. showing no yeah. no emotion, and that kind of really yeah. messes up the scene in a sense. Mm -hmm. So it's another example of, yeah. of pushing something to its... It is. And I think sort of where I come from in, in proposing that we should be self-validating is more of a, a sort of opinion to divorce ourselves from social expectation and the need of the audience. Um, I fundamentally believe we can have a certain degree of social interaction or social validation based solely sort of on the internal interaction between our idea of the self we're presenting and the self that we're experiencing inside. Um, but yes, I think it would become a, a runaway train, I think, if it was embraced fully to the extent that it can be. Um, because I think that goes, it's reminding me of some Marcus Aurelius talking about why men love themselves so much and not, you know, you, you can't find a man who uh, doesn't love another person as much as he loves himself. I think that would be almost the exact sort of pinnacle of hedonism in our society if we get to such a point that we're only self-validating. So I think the social is really important in terms of having this validation, but I argue instead for, we, we shouldn't be focused on validation, we should be focused on fulfillment of having a long-term uh, sort of resonance with the self rather than these sort of short-term hits. I feel like I'm keeping people past appointments. I'll be here all night. I've got no plans tomorrow, so. One more call for questions. I mean, someone crack out the gym. We'll make a thing. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just telling my supervisor. I didn't know he was coming. That was really stressful. <laughs> Two thirds of my doctoral committee was here this evening, so that was fun. You can try, you find out how much your supervisor really likes you. <laughs> I, don't know, I was gauging that he seemed okay. But Payman is an enigmatic man to understand. <laughs> He's a philosopher and a poet. Not, not, a, not a joke, it's actually what he does. So, anything else? So I can ask another question. I mean, I've got questions about what I did too. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, just kind of keep on like the stage thing. So it's something I was trying to think through. There's two things came to mind to me when you mentioned the stage. I was thinking uh, Pirandello's Six Characters in Search of an Author. Mm -hmm. you familiar with that? Uh, no? Okay, then I won't ask that because I'll have to explain it. Then, uh, not a philosopher. Yeah. Well, Pirandello's Six Characters, it's a play. Uh, really the famous one. Not a theater person. After. <laughs> Working class. Um, but Machiavelli um, actually came to mind as well because you're talking about how when we're on digital media, we're trying to be like an elite. Mm -hmm. And an elite in a lot of ways, like the prince. Yeah. Um, and the pr one of the things the prince has to do um, is, because men, Machiavelli says that men perceive the world more within their eyes than they do with their hands. Mm -hmm. And so it brings the idea that Machiavelli is talking about the prince must paint the world. Right. right? And so it's, it seems that digital media is trying to make princes of everybody, or that everybody is trying to be their own prince mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. That they're trying to create kind of like a quasi-city onto themselves. Yeah. Because the prince should be more of like the prince of a city, less prince of a state kind of thing with Machiavelli, the way I understand it. So I'm wondering if you think that's somewhat of an accurate way to kind of think through it, or if mm -hmm. it's just bad. Well, no idea is ever bad. 
<laughs> except structural functionalism. Um, sociology. I've only got one sociologist left. Um, I think how I classify it, rather than being a, a medium that creates princes, is sort of falls back on my understand, understanding of Hordusian sort of field theory and conflict theory, and that is that these social institutions exist for a purpose, and more often than not, that purpose is limiting access to uh, cultural elitism. So in broad terms, it is keeping those who are supposed to be oppressed, oppressed, and making it so it's harder to enter into the group of non-oppressed people. When we see what we think is important in life being dictated by what Instagram influencers who are capitalists who are being paid by corporations to do this, it reinforces means by which we can limit who gets to be uh, elite in the sense of an actual sort of elite class. Uh, I think anytime we have an economic capital behind some kind of media, it has a nefarious purpose for reproducing inequality. And I think social media is no different from that. We talked about sort of deep fakes and the way politics works on social media, which is a very capitalist idea. But just the very sort of way we perceive ourselves in the context of digital media, digital, digital social media, um, I think sort of has a function of, of keeping us lower mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. So, so in, if I may, it's, digital media is kind of like capitalism would more if we're staying, if I stay on the Machiavelli kind of mm -hmm. metaphor, capitalism be kind of like the prince mm -hmm. making the world, and then bringing Marx into it, it's just false consciousness. Yeah. In the end, kind it's of. false consciousness. It's subjugated knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, it's a. Uh, it's a whirlwind of, of terror and fear and loathing. I think, to be quite frank. Um, yeah, no, I, and I think too, you know, we become agents of our own subjugation by participating in mm -hmm. social media because we continue to reproduce both the, the sort of arbitrary ideals that denote elitism and also we're forced to participate in them um, if we want to maintain our membership there. So, yeah. Just a far less academic question, but like the majority of the most liked items on Instagram mm -hmm. are made out of. Justin Bieber's and Selena Gomez is mm -hmm. posting these type of elite photos. Yeah. But the most liked photo in the world is a picture of an egg. Yeah. Just an egg. And I, what does that mean in practical sense? We really, we really like, uh, <laughs> In our social media experiences, we are also not invulnerable to the social phenomenon of fads and, and whimsy. You know, everybody in the 70s had moon shoes. And I keep going back to the 70s. Let's do, a, let's do a 30s one. Everybody was in poverty in the 30s. It wasn't, it wasn't a fad. But the idea of fads, I think, it applies there because it becomes sort of a viral behavior to do, and it's a way to sort of get yourself into the in group. And it's sort of a you know, it's a commentary. It's a it's a satire, I think, and we really do jump for that too. I can't explain why cats are so popular. That I really. I have no explanation for why that's become a thing, um, but I, I think that's that's what sort of explains the egg picture a little bit. Is it's it's kind of our need to conform to the the flows of society, and then also just society's ability to pop up random things that everybody becomes attached to for a while. <laughs>